deep seismic reflection profiling, these images are classic and they come from offshore northwest Scotland. Well, these images change the way in which we view crustal scale deformation. These zones of intense reflectivity that are oblique through the crust are generally interpreted to be shear zones, zones of essentially ductile faulting that have stacked or once stacked up the crust to make mountain belts. Well, these seismic profiles give a very simple view of the structure of deformed continental crust, suggesting it all happens on rather simple shear zones. And that is at odds with a classical view of deformation in the deep crust that you get when you study rocks that have come up from those levels and are now exposed to outcrop. Intense structural complexity. So we have this contradiction, if you like. Well, let's confront this contradiction by going to look at some rocks in Northern Scotland. We're going to be dealing with these yellow rocks here, a package known as the Moyne. These are metamorphosed sedimentary units. And if you scruff around, you can even find primary depositional structures like cross bedding. We're going to go up and have a look at this area here on the north coast of Scotland. So let's go and visit that classic ground quite close to where those seismic data were first acquired. The northern part of the county of Sutherland is a landscape of mountains and moorland, bog and shallow lochens. At first sight, not a great place for great structural geology. But the coast holds the prize. Fantastic weather washed outcrops, all very accessible. Well, these are sandstones, or they're metamorphosed sandstones, Samites, and they look like they've just got simple bedding, don't they? But this simplicity and appearance belies some pretty intense deformation. If we scout around the outcrops here on the north coast, we can find evidence for that deformation and maybe try and analyse it. So let's go and have a look around. So these are deformed conglomerates. It doesn't look like it to start with, but you can pick out these lenses, which are large class that have been flattened down and in three dimensions look like dinner plates. So pretty intense ductile deformation within these metasediments. Well, these are really amazing outcrops. Look at this. These quartz objects are strung out on this surface. But to get an idea of what they're like in three dimensions, we need to use the top surface and the front surface in here. So come on round and have a look at this. So on this face, you can see them strung out. But on the front face, they look hardly deformed at all, which means that in three dimensions, all these quartz objects are like a pile of pencils. They're rod shapes going down like this. Well, this is an L texanite, alpha linear. The rock is intensely rodded. The strain is said to be constrictional. So the rock has been extruded out in this intense fabric.
but there are also large areas of rather simple inclined foliation, just as we might interpret on seismic profiles. Well, there's some pretty nice foliation here just coming down the outcrop and it doesn't look very deformed, does it? It just looks like it's just general sort of, could almost be bedding. But if you look down on the outcrop in detail, well, I can see here is a really good grain shaped fabric with elongate grains. Well, let's have a look just down here and we can see it perhaps a bit more clearly. So here's the foliation plate see on it this rather clear fabric running up and down and let's just look really closely it's defined by elongate grains of quartz and feldspar so an intense stretching lineation on a foliation it's an ls tectonite l for lineation s for stistosity they're together to here in the same rock classic for shear zones so this all looks rather simple doesn't it pebbles quartz veins and sand grains all flattened and pulled out and smeared into the shear zone. This is all very expected. Planar fabrics will be smeared, rotated down towards parallel with the so-called shear plane, the base of this box. And previously undeformed objects like grains represented by the circle here will be strung out into the shearing direction, creating a stretching lineation. What about folding and all that structural complexity that we expected to find an outcrop? There doesn't look to be much going on here. Well, it's not quite as simple as simple planar foliation with a linear fabric on it. Let's go over here and see some other structures. folding in here. Let's look at these in a bit more detail. These are similar folds, so-called because each layer has an almost identical profile, which means as we go around the fold we go from thin limbs to thick hinges and back to the thin limbs again. And the limbs are generally parallel to the main foliation. These tight structures have axial traces, generally in this orientation too. Contained within the overall foliation, so they're called intrafolial folds. And the hinge lines are going straight into the outcrop like this. So how do folds achieve these orientations that we find in shear zones? Let's explore this using a simple cartoon. So here's an example of a fold in a shear zone. Let's just highlight it. The layer starts off like this and has been sheared over into a pair of similar folds. In 3D the hinge line goes off like this and with increasing shear, the hinge line rotates into the shear direction. Let's look at this in our cartoon shear box. A fold can start like this and shear over. Here's the stretching direction, which is the transport axis of the shear zone. And here are the hinges. So hinges can start off at a high angle to the transport direction, but with progressive deformation, become increasingly parallel to it. And of course the fold hinges are swung into parallel with the main stretching lineation in the shear zone. A 
the end result is everything smeared out into parallelism. But that betrays and hides the history of folding and the modification of the folds as the shearing's developed. So the, the shear zone complexity, you really have to hunt around to find. Okay, so let's go and look for some other folds. We'll go inland now. There's some pretty spectacular outcrops up here. So, up in land here now, lots of pretty neat folds, but there's a, one particular piece on this outcrop that is really special, so it's up here. And this is it. It's got a strange elliptical trace of the layering. It goes around here like this and right back on itself. And in three dimensions, it's going to come out and make a test tube, flattened test tube type shape, or a tongue of uh, layers coming out of the rock. And the hinges are going in like this, straight in. Well, if I look underneath in here, I can see that there's an intense mineral elongation or stretch lineation in here, which is also going in like that. So that's the stretching direction and the hinges of the folds are going in like that, parallel to the stretch lineation. In three dimensions, the fold comes out and around. It's a sheath fold. So all these fold geometries are diagnostic of high amounts of simple shear. The fold hinge lines are parallel to the stretch lineation. And in extreme cases, where the initial fold might have had a small bow or curvy linearity to it, both hinges on both sides have spun round to make a loop pattern. When you slice across it, it looks like this, a sheath fold. Diagnostic of really high simple shear strains. This is a really big shear zone. And folding can occur repeatedly during the life of a shear zone, generating really complicated fold interference patterns like these outcrops from the Moyne. So these localities on the north coast of Sutherland are fantastic for informing how folds work within shear zones, helping us to understand how complexity is developed even in zones of rather large scale simple structure. And the really neat thing is we can sit on the north coast and gaze off over the sea to where the seismic profiles were acquired. Well, perhaps the seismic profiles are great at telling us about the organisation of these simple structures through the crust, but if we want to understand what's going on in the shear zone itself, then we really need outcrops like the ones we've just visited to tell us what's going on. And we can use the structures in them to find out which direction the shear zones move, something that's really hard to establish from seismic data. But it's the marriage of both outcrop and seismic that help us understand continental deformation.